I'll turn it over to Chris to talk about this um, great work that we've been doing with the National Forest here in Greater Yellowstone over the last uh, five plus years. So Chris, why don't you take it away? Thanks, Scott. Um, I'm gonna start here with sharing my screen just for a second. All right, is that coming through, Scott? Can you see? Oh, we're on the wrong slide, though. <laughs> there we go. Thumbs up. Okay. Well, thanks, Scott, for the intro. And also thanks to all of our participants today. It's great to see our, our supporters and uh, friends from across the country uh, interested in the work that we're, we're doing. And um, work that I'm, I'm really proud to be a part of here at, at GYC. Um, today we're going to take an in-depth look at one of our successful partnerships with the Forest Service, but I think we, um, we're going to start with a little bit of background on bears and GYC and, and just maybe a little bit of my history at Greater Yellowstone Coalition. Um, I started with GYC in 2008. I'm based in Jackson, Wyoming. I'm not in the upper green right now, but that's one of my favorite parts of the ecosystem. And so hence the background. Um, I started working on some of these, these human conflict, wildlife conflict issues and started kind of at a pretty small scale. Uh, when I first started at GYC, we were doing things like putting out five bear boxes and campgrounds or uh, occasionally working with a community to work on bear proofing those communities, um, but not really thinking about this work at scale. And that's something that I think uh, GYC through evolution and our leadership and our board um, has really challenged us to begin to think about how to address human grizzly bear conflicts at scale in the ecosystem to make a difference for bears. Um, i start started just with, you know, why, why bears? Why are bears so important to GYC or, or to, to us as humans? And I think probably more than any other species, they are the symbol of greater Yellowstone and its wildness. Um, they are also the part of our founding. So Greater Yellowstone Coalition was, was founded in 1983 under this premise that we have to manage this place as an ecosystem across these political boundaries, and bears really embody that. Um, bears don't know boundaries within this ecosystem, where the Park Service, where Yellowstone ends and, and Teton Wilderness begins. And um, they're also, they also inspire awe and, and a lot of respect from, from us as um, their co-inhabitants in this ecosystem. And as an umbrella species, biologically, they're really important as well. They are a species that uh, if we can improve and maintain the habitat to support grizzly bears, we're able to support all the other living wildlife here in the ecosystem with those, with those protections. And so they're very important for that reason for us. Um, and, then, and then lastly, you know, they're a a conservation reliant species. There are species that probably will always require some degree of, of human assistance to continue to reduce these conflicts and maintain them, uh, coexist with bears on the landscape. And before we really take this deep dive, I want, to, I want this to be as interactive as it can be via Zoom. I wish we were all in person. Um, but I thought maybe I'd start by asking all of you if you'd write in the chat, if you've ever seen a grizzly bear in the wild, and if so, where? Um, we have people from all over the country on this, this webinar, and so I'm kind of interested in hearing what your experiences are with bears, if you would share that in the chat. I'm gonna have to try to view this from the same time, you'll see what I'm seeing. Um, my first grizzly bear encounter was in Alaska as well, Susan. Um, up near Haines, Alaska was my first experience with bears and conflict with bears as I watched um, a fishing camp that got destroyed by a, a sow with cubs. Looks like a lot of experience here in Yellowstone, Denali, Katmai. I also have been up to Katmai. What an experience that is to, to view bears up, up in that habitat. Um, 
I'm surprised I'm not seeing a lot of bear watching here in Grand Teton National Park. And uh, here in Jackson, where, where I'm currently at, where I live and make home, um, we probably have some of the best bear watching opportunities anywhere in the world right now and uh, drawing millions of visitors annually. And proud to say that's uh, my backyard. 399 in Jackson, yep, she is, uh, she's very well recorded. Ooh, South Hills outside of Twin Falls, Idaho. Heidi, I wanna hear more about that one later. I spent the summer working in the South Hills uh, with the Forest Service in 2000 and 2002. Great, well, I, we have an informed crowd um, and that's fantastic. Moving along here. Um, start with some really basic history about Yellowstone's grizzly bears and um, starting with pre-European settlement, grizzly bears occupied most of the habitat from about the Mississippi River, the plains, the west of the Mississippi River, all the way to the Pacific from Alaska to, to Mexico. And today um, their range has is really just a remnant of that uh, previous population with a uh, few populations extending across the border in, in Northwest Montana, Northern Idaho and Washington. And then this island population here in Yellowstone, in, in and around Yellowstone National Park. Um, this population was brought down to a decline, uh, a, the, the low point um, in, the, in the 70s and early 80s, it was estimated that there are only about 135 bears left in this ecosystem to today where uh, the estimates range from 700 to over a thousand bears in the GYE. And um, also really interesting today is that the distance between that island that you can see there around Yellowstone and uh, those other populations to the Northwest has dramatically shrunk and it uh, estimated today that's only about 45 miles. And this is, is really a conservation success story um, for the Endangered Species Act. And since those Endangered Species Act protections in 1975, we've seen uh, grizzly bears rebound and expand into habitat that they haven't been seen for in over 100 years. Um, and like I said, about a 45 mile separation between those species that could, could provide potentially connectivity uh, between the Northern Continental Divide ecosystem and here in, in Greater Yellowstone. Um, this graphic I'm about to show you is, is a representation of this growth over time, and it's provided to us by the Interagency Grizzly Bear Study Team. Um, I think it does a really good job of just showing how important Yellowstone was to um, protecting bears and preventing them from going extinct, and then how that population has shifted and expanded outside of the park into new habitats over time. And I'll, I'll, I'll play this a couple times for everybody to, to kind of watch and, and think about. So starting in, in 1984 with this and running through, through 2012, you can see how the density of grizzly bears has um, moved from really within the core of, of the park, in the, the center there. And then the, the black line around that is what's called the primary conservation area for grizzly bears and then beyond that line. And so uh, bears are expanding and, and uh, repopulating habitat that has been vacant for many years. I'm going to go back and just run that one more time. And just want to note how the densities uh, in, inside of the park have expanded and a couple of key areas jump out at me, particularly being from Wyoming, not that I'm biased, but we see uh, expansion of bears into the upper green area between the, um, the Wind River Range and the Tetons and the Teton Wilderness. You see how important the, the Wind River Indian Reservation and lands outside of Dubois have become for grizzly bears. The areas to the west of Cody and um, on the Absorca Beartooth Front have some of the highest density of grizzly bears anywhere in the country. And then looking to the west over in the Island Park area of, of Idaho, you can see how the population has expanded and, and the densities have increased outside of, outside of the park and outside of the primary conservation area. And uh, now I just wanna start with 
a little overview of GYC's work. And you know, we have long been involved in grizzly bear advocacy and grizzly in grizzly bear conservation efforts, like I said, since our inception. And really, as part of our, our founding, grizzly bears have been critical to our brand of advocacy. It has been long been on our logo. Um, grizzly bears have, have been there since, since 1983. And um, that work has evolved over time as bears, as that shift of bears and the density expansion of grizzly bears into new places, increased population. Um, you know, the, the protection for grizzly bears has, has shifted as well. And uh, for us, came to a realization that we have to figure out how to live with grizzly bears on this landscape um, and what it means to have bears. For us, we boil down into our, our three C's. And we, we focus in on working around conflict reduction, promoting connectivity, and providing core habitat for grizzly bears. Um, when, when, we, when I first started at GYC, I would say we were still interested in all of these things, but we weren't really thinking about them at scale. And this partnership that I'm gonna describe is an attempt for our work to, to scale up and look at um, a bigger picture for grizzly bear conflicts and how to reduce those conflicts on the landscape. The first uh, working on secure, secure habitat is really some of the bread and butter of what GYC has done for a very long time. Um, ensuring that bears have the habitat they need means that we have wild places. And if you have wild places for grizzly bears, you're protecting wild places for all wildlife in the GYE. And so, you know, we've long worked on uh, opposing development proposals, working on land use management plans, working to um, protect bears and their habitat as there are proposed expansions into these areas. Um, we'll focus on just kind of three highlights of this work over the last eight years. We work to protect 1.2 million acres through the Shoshone National Forest Plan, new forest plan that came out for that forest. Um, that land was protected for, from uh, occupancy, surface occupancy from oil and gas leasing. We've worked to protect uh, over 30,000 acres from mining in the Paradise Valley that was came about through the uh, Yellowstone Gateway Protection Act. And we helped protect over 40,000 acres in the Wyoming range, um, protected from oil and gas drilling. And that's just in the, the last eight years. This is kind of long, long history at GYC of doing this type of work. Uh, focusing in on connectivity, the uh, give you an overview of what this map on, on your left is showing you. This is a, a map of possible pathways that uh, particularly male grizzly bears may use to connect between ecosystems. Um, this, this is research that was provided from Peck et al. Um, we started using this kind of data to inform where and how we work on things like transportation planning, which communities to work on, uh, work with collaborative efforts around reducing conflicts, and also how to secure private lands. Um, this has led to projects like our, our work with the RBSA, the Ruby Valley Strategic Alliance, to reduce conflicts with grizzly bears up in the Ruby Valley in Montana, working with the Centennial Valley Association on reducing conflicts with grazing and grizzly bears. And then also we uh, established a private land fund to help protect uh, critical private lands in the ecosystem, particularly in those areas that you can see are highlighted in purple on, on that map. And then the last C for us is, is conflict reduction. And uh, first, start with the problem. The problem is that too many, too many grizzly bears are dying uh, due to conflicts with humans. And this is part of the long story of, of grizzly bear occupancy and uh, grizzly bears relationship with humans uh, in post-European settlement of the West. Um, Today, over 80% of all mortalities with grizzly bear, of grizzly bears are due to human causes. And we try to lump these mortalities into four main buckets. Um, conflicts with livestock, conflicts with hunters, um, the, the continued problem with bears receiving human food rewards, and accidents that occur on our highways and with other infrastructure. And, here in the GYE, it's become more and more of a problem with canals in the Cody area up in 
the Northern Continental Divide ecosystem, there's a problem with railroads. And so that those type of accidental, con, uh, accidental mortalities. And this is some of the, this is some of the work that we're, we're doing to address those conflicts. Um, photo on the left here is, is some work that we're doing with outfitters on the Bridger Teton National Forest, as well as ranchers on uh, the, the Beaverhead Deer Lodge National Forest. And, and here in the upper green, we're placing these large containers, storage containers that are bear proof for uh, securing attractants that occur at outfitter camps and at cowboy camps. Um, we get to do things like putting up bear poles. And uh, this is one of my finer days at GYC as a staff person climbing to me on the right, uh, climbing up and putting up bear poles. And, and we wish every day was spent 20 miles into the Teton wilderness. Um, you know, we work to install signs at trailheads and campgrounds and, and various educational things that uh, GYC is, has a long history in working on. Um, we also work to prevent conflicts with livestock, like I mentioned, um, in places like the Tom Minor Basin, outside of the Paradise Valley there in Montana, Centennial Valley, Ruby, Ruby Valley, and Upper Green. We've worked with livestock producers on various tools to reduce conflicts between livestock and grizzly bears. Um, things like range riders, electric fencing, carcass removal. And then uh, that photo on the left is uh, Shana Dremel that works for GYC working on a flattery project that is electric fencing that's specifically meant to deter wolves from entering an area. Um, and then another uh, really important program that we've uh, continued to work on throughout our last 20 years has been working to retire or reduce conflicts with grazing through voluntary buyouts. And this could be a, a, a buyout which eliminates grazing, retires grazing, retires those AUMs from the landscape, or it could be a conversion where we work with a producer to convert their, um, their operations to some other lower risk operations that may be from sheep to cattle or reducing AUMs or relocating. And over the last 20 years, we've helped retire uh, nearly 900,000 acres from, from grazing on public lands. And GYC in just the last uh, eight years completed about half of that as we ramped our efforts up and increased um, our thought that we need, to, we need to bring these projects to scale. <clears throat> and okay, that's, a, that's a lot of GYC's history. Um, pretty quick overview of GYC's history. And now I want to talk a little bit about the history of Yellowstone grizzlies and, and some of um, the operations that bring us to the conflicts that we're dealing with today. And um, as we take this dive, just, you know, it's kind of shocking for some, I think, to see these photos that, you know, in the early 1900s, feeding grizzly bears was allowed and, and maybe even encouraged. Um, it was part of the attraction to Yellowstone. It was for visitor enjoyment and, um, and recreation to go out and watch these things happening. And it, it probably likely uh, helped prevent their ex extirpation here in the ecosystem. Uh, grizzly bears were kind of a valued commodity to, to view and, and watch for human enjoyment. Um, in, in the 60s and 70s, uh, feeding was discontinued. And as a result of that, what we saw was uh, numerous bears, and I think the number is somewhere around 230 bears that were killed as a result of those increasing conflicts with, with humans. Um, the old adage that a fed bear is a dead bear um, continues today. And, and that uh, we saw that particularly with the feeding of bears in Yellowstone and the conflicts that occurred after that feeding was discontinued. Um, Food, bears conditioned to human foods uh, continue to be destructive to both human property and also human safety risk. And, you know, we see this occur, we saw this occur, especially in the early 80s and into the 90s as there was, um, as bears began to expand out of Yellowstone and in, into new habitats. And over the last 40 years, the agencies and communities around the GYE have worked together to really clean up our act and, and reduce these conflicts, um, allowing the population to uh, at least triple, possibly even uh, quadruple 
over that time. And together, I think that's that's been a really remarkable success story here in the ecosystem. Um, as these conflicts have reduced, we've been able to increase human safety and, and remarkably there are you know, millions of visitors that come to Yellowstone today with, with reasonably few conflicts with grizzly bears. Um, and this has occurred using many tactics. And so just to highlight a few of the remarkable steps that have been made, you know, all of the forests around the greater Yellowstone ecosystem have taken, taken steps to uh, require that attractants are stored in a manner that the bears can access. Um, we have had communities that have created regulations that require bear-proof garbage containers. The dumps have been closed. Um, there's been so much done on education and outreach to promote bear safety all around the ecosystem. And this transition has occurred um, over the last 40 years in, in a really um, positive way. And I can't uh, thank the agencies enough for their work in doing that. And that kind of goes from Yellowstone National Park down to um, the state agencies, state game agencies, the Forest Service, as well as uh, the communities around the ecosystem that have taken steps. I know I saw somebody on here from Red Lodge and a mention of Red Lodge. They had one of the first food um, community food storage orders in their community to require bear-proof garbage containers, just a great example of that. Um, Cody has required a, a, or implemented a fence, electric fence that we help them pay for around their dump. Um, the work that that's happening here in, in Jackson to reduce these conflicts. And we've seen bears expand accordingly with all of these great efforts. So I'm gonna pause for a second and just see um, from, from you, ask you what efforts you've made to be safe while camping or recreating in, in bear country. And if, if you would, please uh, comment in the, in the chat feature if you've carried bear spray, um, used, used a garbage container that's uh, bear resistant, used a bear safe storage container while hiking or, or in a campground, or have you ever threw a bear bag over a bear pole? And I'm gonna look at the chat as we're going here. Again, it looks like we have a pretty informed crowd. Um, Myself, I've, I've done all the above as well. Um, I've only had to use my bear spray once and it was on a moose. So um, if folks know, ever had any interest, bear spray is very, very effective on anything with uh, mucous membranes and it, uh, it works for moose as well, as well as uh, angry, angry dogs. Fantastic, I'm glad uh, to see that everybody knows um, how to how to use these tools. And I think, you know, if we have any questions on this at the end, we're happy to answer them. And we have quite a bit of experience here at GYC and, and with others on the, on the webinar that can help chime in on that if there's any questions. So, Unfortunately, these bear human conflicts persist. And this isn't because of lack of effort as much as it, as it may be as grizzly bears are expanding beyond their um, really what is secure habitat for grizzly bears and coming into more of this human interface. And, and we see this in the form of, of grizzly bear conflicts at campgrounds, um, destruction of property to access food like this camper in the middle. And then on the right, this is a, a cow in the upper green that was unfortunately killed by a grizzly bear. And um, we were out investigating one day that we were out looking at some other conflict reduction measures in the, in the upper green. And um, these conflicts what may have been focused at the core of the ecosystem. If you recall some of those early conflict slides I showed with conflicts in and around Yellowstone National Park are expanding outwards to into new occupant occupied habitat uh, that grizzly bears haven't occupied for over a hundred years. And part of the story that is really difficult to talk about um, is that grizzly bears can be a human safety issue. And 
well, it's remarkable to live here and, and recreate and enjoy a place alongside grizzly bears. Um, grizzly bears are capable of injuring or possibly killing humans. And it's very infrequent. Um, again, we have over 5 million visitors annually that come here to the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Um, so it's, it's very rare, um, far more likely to be killed in an automobile accident traveling to or from Yellowstone National Park than, than we are from grizzly bears, but it is a possibility. And whenever it occurs, it's very newsworthy. Um, it cap captures national media and, um, you know, there's a strong reaction from the public in response to a grizzly bear more related human mortality. And I, but I think this slide should point out just how successful those, all those efforts that were occurring early on to protect grizzly bears here in the ecosystem really proved to be for human safety. So um, from 1900 to 1986, there were about seven human caused, sorry, grizzly caused human mortalities here in the ecosystem. And then we went 23 years without, um, without any human mortalities and, and relatively few human injuries here in the ecosystem. Um, and, you know, that's, in response to all of that good work that was happening between the agencies and the NGOs and the communities around the ecosystem. Um, but that, that kind of all changed in 2010 and 2011. And we had a series of tragic events here in, in the GYE. We had four human mortalities due to grizzly bears over the course of two, two years. And one of those at a Forest Service operated campground in Soda Butte outside of Cook City. And that really triggered a, a reaction from the managers of, of those public lands. And, and I think, um, you know, it, they began to look at the risk mitigation and human safety as bears expand into these, these new habitats. Are the agencies really prepared for mitigating that risk and providing the infrastructure needed in these places where maybe traditionally we haven't had to think about grizzly bears. And you know, it so it just so happened in Soda Butte where the density of grizzly bears has probably remained nearly static over the years. But today we have grizzly bears showing up in places like the south end of the Wyoming range, outside of Big Piney, Wyoming, southern winds, um, all the way out to the big holes in Montana where you know, people are not used to dealing with or thinking about grizzly bear conflicts and campgrounds in particular. And the forest, we're trying to um, address this issue in a really systematic fashion. These, these tragic events uh, triggered a systematic look and assessment of all of Forest Service campgrounds and their preparedness. And this is where GYC comes in and, and saw some opportunity with the Forest Service to try to address these conflicts at scale. So at the same time that we were thinking about our own organization and our own priorities and how we needed to upscale and think about grizzly bear conflicts across the ecosystem and how to reduce them. Uh, same time as the Forest Service was thinking about what do they need to do to make their campgrounds safe. And um, just kind of by coincidence, we were planning these things at the same time and seeing opportunity where uh, there, was, there was tragedy. And I wanna take a second here. Um, I know Dan Tires is on this webinar and I just wanna thank him for his leadership with the Forest Service. He's the grizzly bear habitat coordinator for all of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem forests. And he's been a mentor and um, really just a, a true leader in this, in this um, partnership over the, the last eight years. Um, he was responsible and his team for working with each of the national forests around the ecosystem to survey and look at where conflicts exist, how prepared is the agency and what infrastructure needs that they need to make uh, to provide safety in these campgrounds. They also looked at administrative changes, things like closing a loop that might be particularly dangerous because of its, um, its location like it's next to a spawning cutthroat trout stream, or perhaps shifting from a, a tent campground to a hard-sided only campground. These types of administrative changes that the forest can make um, if they think about these conflicts. 
holistically and look at the, the risk all across the ecosystem. And they went through a process of assessing all of these campgrounds um, using a model. And I, I'm not gonna do it justice, Dan. I'm, not, I'm, I'm hardly going to try. <laughs> um, this model looked at how uh, occupied habitat for grizzly bears over the last 21 years compares to the potential for conflict at these campgrounds, given the proximity to secure habitat and other human activities that may cause mortality for grizzly bears. One of the things we know is that uh, developed sites and particularly roads are a strong indicator for grizzly bear potential mortality. They, uh, they take grizzly bear habitat from being secure to being unsecure. By combining uh, all of these factors into a model and looking at it across all of the 164 campgrounds in the ecosystem, Forrest was able to put out um, a coefficient for potential conflict. Using that coefficient for potential conflict, it created a script for prioritizing all of the infrastructure needs of these campgrounds. And as you can imagine, um, some of the campgrounds that are nearest grizzly bear habitat and have had grizzly bears in and around them for many years are mostly very prepared and they had you know, necessary infrastructure already in place. Some campgrounds further, further afield or further distance from the, the heart of the ecosystem um, had, had less preparedness. And so using this model, they were able to create this prioritized needs list across all of the campgrounds in the ecosystem. And Greater Yellowstone Coalition um, was able to raise significant funding for this partnership. And, and I thank all of the donors and foundations and support that we had over the years to raise these funds. Um, we started with a $125,000 match that we were able to match one-to-one -one with the forest to not only prioritize um, the, the needs, the forest, I guess, did not only prioritize their needs, but they also prioritized their funding because there was an incentive from a partner organization to match their dollars for, for these needs. And you know, that, through doing that, we were able to shift priorities across forests, not only across forests, but across administrative regions. And so here in the GYE, we have uh, five national forests that are in three different regions across three different states. Within those national forests, you have a um, whole collection of staff, line officers, and district rangers who also have uh, power and authority over making decisions on each of these campground areas. And so the opportunity here was to look at all of this need and all of this work at scale by prioritizing funding. And what um, the result of that was uh, a tremendous success. And we were able to raise and leverage over $1.2 million for the infrastructure needs here around in and around Yellowstone National Park. Sorry, not inside Yellowstone National Park, on the national forests around national, Yellowstone National Park. Um, that resulted in over 1,200 bear boxes purchased and installed, uh, 16 dumpsters, uh, numerous gates and kiosks across these campgrounds. And just to give you a few of the, the numbers on the Shoshone National Forest, they, they were first to really see this opportunity. And uh, thanks to that forest super supervisor, Joe Alexander at the time, for seeing that opportunity and jumping at, at it with us. Um, in the first year, they addressed all of their needs, which is 138 bear boxes in their campgrounds. Um, the Bridger Teton National Forest received 346 bear boxes in their campgrounds. Caribou Targhee, 260 bear boxes. Custer Gallatin, 452 bear boxes, uh, the, the Beaver Deer, Head Lodge, Deer Lodge National Forest, which just a reminder, much of the Beaver Head Deer Lodge is not in the, in the GYE, just a, a small portion of it. Uh, they received nine bear boxes in the Beaver Head Deer Lodge. And now we're looking at opportunities today at expanding that as bears continue to expand on the Beaver Head Deer Lodge National Forest. And Here's a, a depiction of just where grizzly bear habitat, or sorry, where grizzly bear distribution is across uh, the ecosystem, that purple line as bears expand out. And you can see the proximity to each of those 164 campgrounds. 
And so uh, this was the, the first time we really worked at this scale. And uh, what that looks like is a lot of bear boxes in a lot of different campsites, which isn't the, I guess, the most compelling imagery. But uh, you can see where in some of these photos, the work that was happening on the ground as, as bear boxes were installed um, across these campgrounds, I believe 101 campgrounds received grizzly bear food storage boxes through this partnership. And um, this is, a, I think, a model for our work moving forward. We, we feel that there is opportunities to leverage funding and prioritize needs at a systematic scale that's measurable and using um, the analysis that the Forest Service did as, as a model, we can measure what our impact is of this investment and how we can reduce conflicts and the potential for conflicts across the landscape by um, partnering and doing this kind of work. And that's leading uh, for us to new opportunities. We uh, continue to work on bear boxes and work in campgrounds, but um, we're transitioning now to what might be next for us. And the, I think where we're headed with the forest is using this as the model. We can work on all five national forests at scale and looking at addressing some of the other main needs that, that these forests have. Um, one of those needs is around illegal roads that are occurring on the ecosystem. And I actually snapped this photo on the left just last weekend as a, a UTV drove around a barricade on a closed road on, here on the Bridger Teton National Forest. And you can see this map in the middle. This is the network of roads. These are the legal roads within the GYE. And there are at least as many illegal roads that are occurring. Um, we're working with the forest to try to address this issue and try to leverage funds to uh, secure those, those illegal roads. And that has many benefits. Um, benefits in securing habitat for wildlife, benefits of addressing the administrative needs of these forests and complying with their forest plans and works, work that they've been planning to do for, for many years. Um, it also reduces conflicts and can make the use of legal roads and uh, the recreation visitor experience better by providing access where it's legal in a safe way. And so uh, we embarked on this next partnership with the Caribou Targhee National Forest just this summer. Uh, that work is ongoing today and we'll be coming back to you and talking about it in the future and a lot of good work on the horizon on this front. And with that, I'll, I'm going to hand it over to Scott. Great. Thanks, Chris. Um, really appreciate that. Um, I'm sure we, we have a few questions already. Before I jump into those, I just want to highlight some of the upcoming opportunities uh, that, that you will have to learn more about our work and, and conservation here in Greater Yellowstone. On October 20th, we're going to be talking about food, water, and buffalo, um, and uh, connection to the Wind River Reservation, where we have a whole new program area of work here at Greater Yellowstone Coalition. Um, and then restoring bison and a North American um, icon. So you'll, you'll learn about first our work with indigenous communities on the 20th and then on the 3rd, more specifically about our work to expand the Yellowstone Bison uh, Conservation uh, and Transfer Program. So two more upcoming opportunities. Also, we launched a podcast not, not too long ago, uh, and you can find that through our website or any of the places that you listen to uh, your podcasts, uh, and I encourage you to jump on there and learn, uh, use that as another opportunity to learn about our work and, and conservation here in Greater Yellowstone. Um, Chris, I think what we should do now is open it up for questions, and I'll kind of moderate this through the chat box. Um, if you can maybe stop your screen share so that I can have a yep. view of everybody, that would, that would help. Um, great. Um, so I'm going to jump back up here a little bit. Uh, question was, uh, how effective are, this is a bear safety question, but how effective are bells on mountain bikes to alerting bears of human presence? Can they really be heard? Just wondering about bear bells and their effectiveness. Yeah, I'll, I'll attempt to answer that. Um, and I, I got to maybe first admit, I, I enjoy mountain biking myself. And um, 
you know, I think probably the best tool that we have um, at our disposal for preventing conflicts with mountain bikers and bears is it's right here. Um, you know, trying to avoid conflict times for when we ride in the evenings or in the morning hours when bears are very active, um, being aware of our surroundings. And if there's um, a carcass, particularly in an area, watching for birds, those types of um, just bear safe behaviors as we recreate are really critical. Um, making noise as we're as we're biking or any recreation is, is uh, preferred and, and pretty effective at alerting bears to our presence. Um, I would say that bear bells, in my experience, are not loud enough to really provide that. And, um, you know, they also, uh, I guess, they, they are constant noise. And I think the noises that make um, are better for alerting bears are noises that are not kind of a constant droning noise of, of a ringing bell. Um, but I know a lot of people do use them and I think you know that's a, that's a personal choice as to what you use to make noise. I tend to yell, hey bear, when I'm in a, a lot of very berry habitat. Um, but using my head, I think is probably the best tool I have to reducing my potential for conflict. Chris, can you, this is a question from Linda, but can you just describe what exactly is a bear box? What are those contraptions we've been putting in campgrounds? Yeah, why do we spend $1.2 million on boxes? Um, good question, Linda. I'm sorry I didn't explain that. Um, um, bear boxes are, they're metal boxes that are placed in campgrounds for people to put all of their attractants into. So that is their, their cooler, their toothbrush, their toothpaste, their sunscreen, you know, anything with a smell in a campground is, is required under a food storage order on these forests to be secured in a manner that the bears can't access. And the tool that is provided for that in most campgrounds is, is what we're calling bear boxes. Um, they're manufactured, I guess another really important component of this partnership was we worked with local communities, manufacturers to build these bear boxes. So there's a manufacturer in, in Cody, uh, Robertson's Enterprises, and then there's a, there's a manufacturer in Rexburg, Idaho, and they produced all of these 1,200 bear boxes at those locations. Um, they're made out of, I believe, 12 or 14 gauge steel, so very heavy steel um, with latches that are impenetrable by bears. And they've been tested um, at the Grizzly Bear Discovery Center they've been challenged by live bears to see if they can access any attractants inside of them. And so they have to go through a certification process before they uh, receive their patent in their certification that they can sell that as a, a bear proof box. Those bear boxes cost, um, depending on the manufacturer, anywhere between $800 and $900 a piece. And they're planted in the ground, uh, typically with cement, um, on poles in a way that uh, is, is there and, and very lasting. Great. Thanks, Chris. Um, can you talk a little bit about, as a question here from uh, Darian, has hunting or rather hunting restrictions gotten better or have they been, I think it means lacking um, uh, with regard to hunting and grizzly bear habitat? Yeah, and no, I think so I'm, I'm making an assumption here, uh, Darian, from your from your comment that um, that you're you're speaking to ungulate hunting. So you know, hunting that occurs here for elk and deer, primarily uh, in the GYE, as well as moose and pronghorn and other species. Um, there, you know, there really aren't any restrictions on hunters to um, change how they. How, how hunting is happening on the landscape. Much of the effort has occurred, and this is a credit to the state agencies and the federal agencies, primarily to, uh, to educate hunters on doing some of those very same things that I was just talking about with mountain bikers, um, carrying bear spray and being bear aware. And so information goes out now with every hunting license sale, especially for non-resident hunters uh, that come here to the ecosystem to educate them on those potential for conflicts. Um, I can say personally, um, 
you know, as a, as a hunter, when I go out elk hunting in the fall, I, I've changed my behavior in response to grizzly bears on the landscape. Um, do things like not try to hunt in the afternoons when you may have a bear that, or a, a carcass, if you get a, an elk um, that's gonna be left overnight and serve as an attractant. Um, always hunting with a partner trying to stay in the open more and avoiding brushy areas and, and uh, also not trying to make those, those noises that we make as hunters that we try to attract elk with in places where we may attract a grizzly bear. Um, Great. That answers that. Yeah, uh, thanks. Um, question from Ed here. Chris, what, what do you think the optimal bear popul is, population is for Greater Yellowstone? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I, I don't mean to uh, dance around an answer for you, but I, I think it's really, um, it's really up to what human social tolerance will allow for bears. And so, you know, there's an, a, many attempts to put a number on the population. And right now there's a look at changing the counting methodologies that might uh, make it appear that there are more bears in the ecosystem just as a result of shifting methodologies. And um, really what I think we should focus in on is how do we live with bears and how do we have tolerance for bears by um, reducing the conflicts with bears in these ecosystems. So it's, it's very hard to put a number, a specific number to say, this is, uh, this is the optimal bear population. The other thing I would say is that um, in our view, what is probably most optimal for grizzly bears is having a connected meta population uh, of grizzly bears here in the Northern Rockies. And so that is promoting connectivity between bears here in the GYE and bears in the Northern Continental Divide ecosystem and Bitterroot ecosystems, hopefully in the future. And that's why we've really focused a lot of our work uh, in that landscape where bears can connect and um, hopefully uh, move between and, and we'll have in the future um, bears connected in these, in these places. And that's probably more important to the long-term uh, survival of grizzly bears than putting a focal number on an optimal population. Yeah, just a, a quick follow up on that, Chris. I mean, so much of our conflict reduction work is uh, is geared towards building and maintaining social tolerance because we know that bears bears will only live and survive where where humans allow them to. And so, if we can reduce the chances of, uh, for a conflict between people and livestock, um, people and bears and livestock, uh, any of those then social tolerance tends to be higher um, and support for living with bears and coexisting tends to, um, tends to remain in areas where we don't have that and there's you know, continued conflicts or there's slow response time to those conflicts or any of those things that you know, to tend to freak people out, <laughs> um, then it's, it becomes more challenging. But you're right Scott, and yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry to interrupt, but you know, one more thing to add, I think, um, you know, we, we want to see what we can do to have more bears on the landscape. And, you know, one of the ways that we know we can do that is by having more secure habitat on the landscape. And that um, kind of transitions well to our future partnership work with the forests and trying to secure more habitat for grizzly bears uh, means that hopefully we can, we can have more bears on the landscape, which increases the likelihood of that connectivity occurring. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and Keith makes a good point here. Ideally, it needs to be connected. That that meta population that Chris talked about is a, a fancy word for saying one big, healthy, connected population. And that's that's hopefully what we're we're aiming for. And it's not too far down the road. I know Chris has maybe a number of different bets riding on how quickly <laughs> the populations will connect, but we see that as part of our job, making sure that that can happen over in the in the future. A uh, question from Chris. Hey, Chris, um, if connectivity is reached, could delisting occur? 
Well, um, connectivity has not been reached yet to our knowledge and delisting uh, has been attempted twice now here in the ecosystem, once in 2008, once in 2016. Um, so I would say that, you know, it, it is somewhat questionable if connectivity that what I'm talking about, you know, interconnected meta population is a requirement because I think, you know, and just last week we saw um, efforts by the state of Wyoming to petition the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for moving forward again with delisting. And so um, I, I'm hopeful that connectivity is, is achieved, but I, it's more than just one bear connecting. When I'm talking about connectivity, I'm, I'm talking about um, having, having connectivity that includes occupancy. And so having grizzly bears, particularly sows with cubs in places that they can connect is an important part of, of what's called demographic connectivity rather than just one bear at one time crossing that 45 miles and breeding. It's, it's, um, it's more important to have occupied habitat and have a flow of genetic material between these populations. And that's, that's a very long-term view for the future. Chris, a question from Julie. How, how does law enforcement currently handle known bear feeders? I know this has been an issue around Jackson. Julie, that is speaking to a, a issue very near and dear to me. You have no idea how close, actually. Just we're talking about uh, about two miles from where I live with, uh, with my young family. I have two small children, toddlers, um, and we have a known bear feeder um, in, our, in our neighborhood. And so um, an issue that I care a lot about. Um, so here in Teton County, we have a land development regulation that uh, makes it illegal to feed wild animals. And we're working to expand that right now to include um, not just bears, but uh, other, other wild animals as well and increase the, the fine schedule. Uh, with that feeder here, the Fish and Wildlife Service declined uh, moving forward with, with enforcement and fines. Um, and, and, you know, there's a lot of things that go into that factor of that decision. Um, and thus far, they have not been fined or cited in response to that feeding. Uh, however, it has ceased. And so um, most of these regulations and efforts by communities are really educational opportunities to try to get people to learn how to uh, you know, not feed animals and reduce these conflicts rather than create enforcement and, and citations. Um, and it's imperfect, but I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of peer pressure and, and it's uh, ever improving and evolving here in the ecosystem. Okay, one, one more question. We're right at five o'clock right now. Um, this is from Bridget. Do you partner with the Nature Conservancy or other nonprofits? We do, and um, I probably am remiss on not mentioning all of the partners in this work. Um, so we have you know, work with many, many different partners and communities from uh, other NGO partners, other nonprofits, to the state and federal agencies and uh, local communities and grazing associations. Um, in particular, I'd say here in Wyoming, we've, we've done a lot of uh, partnership work with the Nature Conservancy around wildlife crossing efforts. Um, and that's, that's an area that they have a lot of expertise and uh, scientific capacity around. And so we definitely work with them. We've also worked with TNC on uh, land protections for private lands where we've helped uh, create some bridge funds and support their work to uh, protect, put conservation easements on critical private lands for grizzly bears. Great. Thanks, Chris. And thanks everybody for joining us this afternoon. Um, I hope you learned a lot uh, and are excited about the work that we're doing here at Greater Yellowstone Coalition. Thanks to all of you who are current supporters um, and donating and helping this work happen. Uh, for those of you who aren't, I hope you'll, you'll, hope you'll join us uh, and support this incredibly important work um, in one of the most important natural areas in the entire world. Thanks again for tuning in, sending all the, uh, the positive energy and good vibes I can from Yellowstone to all of you, wherever you may be. So take care, stay safe, and I hope to see you again on the next webinar.
Thanks, everybody. Good to see you.